an Indian perspective on All India Radio. This is Vaibhav Jyotsna Shavastav and with me is Renuka RS bringing glimpses of the major developments of the day from across the globe. Over the next half an hour we shall bring you the latest from the world of politics, economy, sports, entertainment and more. The headlines Over 41 crore 54 lakh doses of covid vaccine administered in India so far. Indian recovery rate of covid-19 reaches 97.36%. Defence Research and Development Organisation successfully flight tested new generation Akash missile. Prime Minister Narendra Modi to share his thoughts with the people in the Mann ki Baat program on All India Radio on 25th of this month. Ariel Henry sworn in as the new Prime Minister of Haiti. All India Radio, Doordarshan and DD Sports to do mega coverage of Olympics 2020. As the nationwide free COVID-19 vaccination campaign at government facilities for those above 18 years is going on, we advise our young listeners to get vaccinated and also to help others to get vaccinated. We also advise our listeners not to lower their guard as COVID-19 remains a threat to our health. Please stay at home unless it is essential to go out and continue to follow these three simple steps. Wear a face mask, maintain 2 gaz ki duri for social distancing, focus on hand and face hygiene. For any covid related information and guidance contact national helpline numbers 011-2397-8046 and 1075. And now the news in detail. India has administered over 41 crore 54 lakh doses of covid vaccine so far under the nationwide vaccination drive over 34 lakh 25000 vaccine doses were administered in the last 24 hours the health ministry said more than 36977 patients recovered during the last 24 hours and the recovery rate is at 97.36% till now more than 3 crore 3 lakh people have recovered from covid 19 The country reported over 42,000 new cases in the last 24 hours. India's active case load has further declined to around 4 lakh 7,000. The active cases constitute 1.30% of the total reported cases so far. Defence Research and Development Organisation DRDO today successfully flight tested the new generation Akash missile, a surface to air missile from integrated test range off the coast of Odisha. The flight trial was conducted from a land-based platform with all weapon system elements such as multifunction radar, command, control and communication system and launcher participating in deployment configuration. The missile system has been developed by the Defence Research and Development Laboratory Hyderabad in collaboration with other DRDO laboratories. During the test the missile demonstrated high maneuverability required for neutralizing fast and agile aerial threats. The Defence Ministry said the new generation Akash missile will prove to be a force multiplier for the air defence capability of the Indian Air Force. Defence Minister Rajnath Singh has congratulated DRDO, Indian Air Force and the industry for the successful test. The Indian Army and Pakistani Army today exchanged sweets on the auspicious occasion of Eid Al Adha at the line of control at Poonch Rawalkot crossing point and Mendhar Hot Spring crossing point in Poonch district. The ceremony is seen as an enhanced confidence building measure in the backdrop of ongoing ceasefire between both the countries. The Indian Army conveyed its greetings and best wishes of peace and harmony to the Pakistani army. The gesture was appreciated by both the armies and is expected to further promote goodwill and mutual trust. Unprecedented rainstorm hit central China's Henan province on Tuesday. battering the capital Zhengzhou and causing flooding that killed at least a dozen people as many as 1 lakh residents were evacuated after the local government issued the highest level of alert for flood response following torrential rains the indian embassy in beijing has expressed sympathy and deepest condolences to those affected and wished for an early recovery from the situation In a tweet the embassy said they are deeply saddened by the reports of floods in Henan province that have caused destruction to life and property hundreds of train and flights have been grounded according to the state rail operator China State Railway Group Co Limited two rail lines have been damaged and others have been affected by the flooding causing widespread travel disruptions Local media reported that over 660 flights or 70% of those scheduled were cancelled Wednesday at Zhengzhou's 
Shenzhen International Airport, according to Veriflight, an aviation data services provider. Belgium fell silent for a minute of remembrance yesterday as it held a day of mourning for the victims of the devastating floods that left 200 dead in Western Europe. Heavy rains late last week sent floodwaters sweeping through towns and villages, mostly in Belgium and Germany, where Chancellor Angela Merkel visited victims in one of the hardest hit areas. At least 31 people were killed in Belgium, with dozens still missing or unaccountable, while Germany on Tuesday increased its death toll to 169 as rescuers scoured the rubble for victims. The number of missing in Belgium has fallen over the past two days as telephone contact is re-established and more people are traced. Belgium's King Philippe and Queen Mathilde paid their respects at the fire stations in Verviers, one of the hardest hit towns. This is the first time since 2016 that Belgium has observed a national mourning and three days were declared following the March 22nd attacks claimed by the Islamic State group, which killed 32 people and injured more than 340 in Brussels. Prime Minister Narendra Modi will share his thoughts with the people in the country and abroad in the Man Ki Baat program on All India Radio on the 25th of this month. It will be the 79th episode of the monthly radio program. The Prime Minister has invited people to share their ideas and topics he would address on the upcoming episode of the program. People can share their views in the Namo app or MyGov Open Forum. They can also dial the toll-free number 1-800-117800 and record their message for the Prime Minister in either Hindi or English. The phone lines will remain open till Thursday. People can also give a missed call on 1922 and follow the link received in SMS to directly give their suggestions to the Prime Minister. In today's hotspot section, we bring you a discussion on India's foreign exchange reserves. In conversation with Sharad Kohli, Economic Analyst and Arjun J. Chaudhary, AIR. The foreign exchange reserves uh, with the central bank, which is acting as a de facto trustee, is 611.89 billion US dollars. And the central bank is also liable to pay dividend to the government of India. The central bank intervenes to stabilize the exchange uh, rate. And uh, right now, with these uh, foreign exchange reserves that the central bank is uh, holding, the question is that uh, what to do next? Will they diversify the investment avenues? So there is a repo rate of 3.35% that the central bank pays on these uh, deposits. It is also covering its external debt. So Sharadji, uh, let's uh, begin by understanding what is the uh, strategy behind the central bank's uh, build-up of uh, foreign exchange reserves to the tune of $611.89 billion. They've clearly covered the external debt which stands $563 billion US dollars. I think a very, very comforting number for any Indian, I would say, not just for the government, not just for the RBI. But I thought any citizen of India who understands this should be proud of the fact that we today have reached a number four in terms of the forex reserves. And it would be interesting for listeners to know that China stands at the top with about $3.3 trillion. Japan stands next at about $1.3 trillion. Switzerland at number three at about $1.07 trillion. And the heartening thing is that India is at number four with $611 billion. Of course, we have overtaken Russia recently, which is about $593 billion, and Taiwan at $541. So I think India is not just uh, the fifth largest uh, economy in terms of GDP, but India is also the number four. And what is important, Arjun, for listeners to know is that what does this signify? Because an average citizen thinks, I mean, if country has collected over $600 billion, how does it benefit me? Well, I, we must tell them that it makes country stronger in terms of its economic prowess. It also gives the country the leverage to probably foot the import bill. It gives the leverage for people to use foreign exchange freely. We, today, we know that under the liberalized remittance scheme, $250,000 each Indian each year can remit. And I think that big number per annum for each Indian came only because we had such a fantastic and such healthy amount of reserves. And also, Arjun, I would like our listeners to know the history is very, very interesting. In 1960, you know, we had forex reserves 
which were barely covering 8.6 weeks of import. Then in 1980, uh, this is another very interesting fact, that India had forest reserves of over $7 billion and we were double the level of China. So this signifies is that with the opening of, of the economy, with liberalization which started in 1990s in India, I think building up of foreign reserves is an outcome because when you open the country for, for the foreigners to come in, for the deposits to come in, for the investments to come in, this is the outcome. So it shows the pragmatic, prudent, rational approach by successive governments in all these years. Sharad, uh, let's uh, touch upon the uh, coverage of our external debt, which is 563 billion US dollars. We have sufficient foreign exchange to last us 15 months. That kind of insurance uh, that the central bank is able to provide because of its uh, reserves is very heartening for the economy. Uh, what does it mean for the exchange rate when it comes to the rupee to the dollar? About an hour ago, it was 74.61 to the US dollar. In fact, in today's trade, it fell by 26 uh, paise. So what is uh, really the tactic of the central bank? Does it want a weak rupee or a strong rupee in order to promote exports, in order to ensure offshore business outsourcing from the Western economies into ours? What do they want with a stability of the currency? Do they want it sufficiently weak or sufficiently strong? It's a bit of a mix of both because a strong rupee obviously, you know, makes your import cheaper. It makes your import bill and considering especially the oil import. Well, over $100 billion is being spent on oil imports every year. So the more stronger the dollar, weaker the rupee. Of course, we are already, you know, we are in the midst of uh, extremely high fuel prices. And uh, one of the reasons for those high fuel prices is a very, very strong dollar because the rupee, as you just announced, the rate. So I think on one side, the country wants rupee to be stronger to keep the import bill under control. On the other side, there are exporters. There is a big export economy within our country. It is one of the pillars of the in fact, which looks forward to a weaker rupee so that it's able to fetch more foreign exchange into the country. So I think it's a very fine balance between on the one side where most people think that probably a stronger rupee is good for us. There is another school of thought which says that probably not very strong rupee may also sometimes be very good for us. So coming down to the forex reserves in this context, Arjun, I would say a healthy foreign reserve gives RBI, who's the manager and the custodian of these forex reserves. Also, everybody should know that RBI sits on them, regulates them, monitors them, collects them, deploys them, you know, so and so forth. So it gives RBI the leverage to keep the exchange rate under control tomorrow if we find that rupee suddenly collapses for any reason. Well, these healthy reserves, I must tell, will come to the rescue. And you will find that RBI is able to make those purchase and sale transactions. We, we call them as open market operations, OMOs. And it can easily control the price of foreign exchange. RBI doesn't interfere too often. But if there is a need, these healthy forex reserves give a very strong arm to RBI, gives a big support to the economy overall to be able to handle these major movements. And of course, the normal movements, day-to-day -day movements, RBI doesn't interfere because they, that they happen because of the withdrawal of funds by FIIs, FDIs, or FPIs, time and again, inflow and outflow of funds. But if there is anything exceptional happening in the economy or in the international economy per se, RBI it would be ready to intervene with these heavy forex reserves. So I think that is the strategy with RBI having, you know, a strong arm. So Sharad, you spoke about uh, the central bank's intervention to stabilize uh, the rupee to the dollar when it comes to the exchange rate. In the short term, the central bank has actually purchased 87 billion US dollars in the spot uh, market in order to uh, strengthen the rupee, which had weakening earlier. And uh, the RBI also has a tactic of selling US dollars in order to increase the strength of the US dollar to the rupee. So why has this been the case right now, purchasing $87 billion in the spot market to strengthen the rupee? As I said, the country was in the grip of inflation, as we all know. And uh, the prime reason for inflation, I think it's an open secret now, are the fuel prices. Knowing that 85% of the uh, fuel bill is being footed from imports, so, and the imports have to be paid in US dollars. So I think a stronger dollar, I would say, increases the import bill, which further add inflationary load. So and in order to control inflation, RBI made purchases to make the rupee stronger so that the import bill is reduced and inflation is kept under control. 
So on the oil import uh, bill, uh, the government of India has now entered into term contracts and uh, spot agreements uh, with the uh, U.S. suppliers uh, for crude oil, replacing Iran when it comes to buying petroleum. Do you see that also as another move to reduce the oil import bill or is it just a, a geopolitical alliance at this stage? There are more geopolitical reasons behind that. The sanctions being imposed, sanctions being withdrawn, then the news of sanctions being imposed again, again withdrawn. So I think Iran and U.S. relations in the past have gone through a lot of ups and downs and they are still not very normal, I would say. So when sanctions come on a country which is a big exporter of imports, I think this is what happens because you have to make spot agreements. You have to make alternate arrangements because if a country is sizable import is dependent on a particular source, you have to make alternate arrangements to make sure that I really don't think that price is majorly affected because of these agreements. Also, foreign portfolio investors have been buying into our securities market, equity and debt, and that's also leading to volatility in the currency. Is it making the tactic of buying or selling U.S. dollars a little bit more difficult for the central bank at this point? The central bank also depends a lot on the market forces. So it would normally not intervene under normal cash flows or inflows or outflows. Well, uh, to understand this better, Arjun, for the sake of our listeners, let me list out the various sources from where, uh, you know, these forex reserves. So I think it will help in better understanding of how the movements happen. Of course, you spoke about foreign portfolio investors. There are foreign institutional investors. There are foreign direct investors who straight away buy in the capital of the country. There are these ADRs and the GDRs, you know, the depository receipts. Then not to forget the export receipts, which we been talking about a little while ago. And of course, along with that comes the capital account and the current account receipts. And another major source, Arjun, for the Forex Reserve is the postal order economy, as it is called in informal terms, which is the deposits made by NRIs. I mean, there are three to four crore Indians settled abroad who earn very handsomely and uh, they find their own country to be safer to park the funds. So I think it's a very dynamic situation at all times. It all depends on what is the level of inflows versus the outflows. So I think Reserve Bank has to very constantly, I would say this monitoring is almost 24 hours. So RBI has to be on a 24-hour guard to see what is happening with these inflows and outflows. And then a decision is taken to stabilize the currency to whether to buy or to sell or to just leave it at the market forces. I think once we understand the various sources, external commercial borrowing, another major source where a lot of private companies, you know, they, they borrow from abroad and, uh, you know, that has to be repaired also. In fact, uh, there is a slight with very few people know there is a slight downside also of these forex reserves because around 35% of these reserves comprises of external commercial borrowings, which have to be repaid as well. You know, so we let's not forget that all all that we have is not permanently ours. I mean, a lot of them has to move out from time to time. But uh, if you look at uh, the payment of uh, the repo rate of 3.35% on the reserves, what are the uh, ways in which the central bank is actually ensuring that they are able to diversify the investment avenue so that, as you just said, that the percentage of reserves that are in the ownership of the government of India actually goes up? We have to accept the fact that these forex reserves are jun they are governed by foreign exchange reserve act and without going into the legal jargon or without going into the finer details of the act to make a layman understand that there is a certain protocol under which you can deploy these foreign reserves, you foreign exchange reserves. You cannot put them to, let's say, for infrastructure development in India. I mean, a lot of people, they come and ask me that with $600 billion plus of reserves, we keep struggling to, you know, find the resources of these infrastructure development, welfare schemes of the government and so on and so forth. Well, we must tell them that these forex reserves are very specifically meant for certain very specific purposes. They cannot be used for usual common pool or common fund of India where you can probably start an infrastructure project. We have to reserve these foreign exchange reserves for those specific predetermined protocol-driven purposes, which is why, you know, the doubts in the minds of an average citizen that with such we keep talking about such healthy reserves, then why is the country struggling on resources, on the overall revenue? Why is the government forced to levy so much of tax on fuel? Why is the government not uh, switching fuel from normal VAT and excise to GST? Well, the reason is because you cannot touch these $600 billion of forex reserves for common funds in India or common pool or common or fund of infant name. But basically, they are for very specified, very designated, very, very particular purpose. 
the central bank is like a commercial bank of the government of India. They have a shareholding in it. Uh, the uh, central bank is liable to pay dividend to the government of India. There is also the requirement of 4.5% of the reserves to be held uh, as a cash reserve under the Bimal Jalan Committee uh, report. So there is a responsibility yep. on the part of the government and the central bank that uh, the relationship yep. is not abused in any which way so that uh, the requirements of foreign exchange are never lost. A lot of questions come when people ask that how are these reserves kept? I mean, is this just one big locker where you have bundles and bundles of dollars lying? No, that is not the truth. Uh, these are deployed in U.S. government bonds, in institutional bonds, and as high as more than 60% is deployed in this manner. Some of them is held also in the form of gold reserves. So within the foreign reserve, about 6%, I would say, average are the gold reserves. So, you know, and government also makes deposits, you know, just like we make a deposit in a bank. Government also makes deposits in foreign central banks and commercial banks. And by the way, in case somebody is wondering that what kind of return does government generate on these huge reserves, you will be surprised to know that the return is not that great because, you know, the returns abroad are very, very minimal, especially if you're deploying them in developed countries. So a return could be 1%, even less, sometimes no return. But the fact that you have $600 billion of reserves, which can help you in your rainy day, I think is very comforting for the government, for RBI, and for the entire population of 138 crore people of India. Thank you so much, Sharad, for being with us on this program and talking to us extensively on the nature of our foreign exchange reserves and why it's so important to actually build it up even further. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is All India Radio giving you the world news. Welcome back to the World News. In Haiti, Ariel Henry has been sworn in as the new Prime Minister around two weeks after the country's President, Jovenel Moïse, was assassinated. Moïse has asked Henry to take up the role days before he was murdered in the capital, port au prince Ariel Henry could not take over the post immediately as he was locked in a political tussle with Claude Joseph, the country's interim Prime Minister at the time of the attack. However, Joseph stepped down on Monday, paving the way not only for Henry's swearing in, but also for elections in September this year. The government authorities in northwest Nigeria say they have freed 100 women and children who were seized by bandits. The freed persons mainly include mothers nursing infants. The group were abducted on the 8th of June in Zamfara State. Four people were also killed during the incident, the Zamfara State government said. They were released without any ransom, however, gave no further details. The group will now be given medical helps and is free before they return to their homes. President Mohamedou Buhari has directed the military to flush out criminals in Zamfara and the neighboring states of Kaduna and Katsina. A state of kidnappings has taken place in the region during recent months. Since December 2020, more than 1,000 people have been abducted. Hosts Japan have kicked off the 2020 Olympic Games in style as they beat Australia 8-1 in softball. The initial two days of games are being held at a baseball stadium at the foot of Lush Hills in Fukushima, a region badly affected by the 2011 tsunami and nuclear disaster. Beijing, 2008 gold medalist softball pitcher Ueno Yukiko delivered the opening pitch of her nation's Olympic Games last night. She would go on to notch her eighth Olympic win as Japan defeated Australia in five innings, 8-1 in an opening round game. Ueno worked around some first inning trouble, loading the bases with one out and conceding the first run to Australia on a hit by pitch. Japan immediately drew level in the bottom of the first on a Yamamoto U RBI single. Then the hosts teed off with the long ball. Sixteen months after the decision was made to delay the Olympics and two days before the official opening ceremony in Tokyo, the Games in Fukushima will, like most other Olympic events, be held behind closed doors due to surging infection figures. After official inauguration on the 23rd of July for the next 19 days till the 8th of August, around 11,000 athletes from 205 countries and regions will compete at venues in and outside the Japanese capital, which is currently under a state of emergency. All India Radio, Doordarshan and DD Sports will do a mega coverage of Olympics 2020. The coverage spans from pre- to post-Olympics and will also be available on digital platforms of Doordarshan and All India Radio. Different sporting events at the Olympics will be broadcast live daily on Daily Sports from 5 a.m. to 7 p.m. 
Listeners from across the country are participating in the Olympic quiz with AIR News. Listeners have emailed us their replies in huge numbers. Damini Balke of Guna in Madhya Pradesh was the first to send the correct answer of the question on the 20th of July. Many congratulations to her from the entire team of AIR News. Speaking to AIR News, Damini Balke expressed her happiness on winning the Olympic quiz and wished the Indian Olympic contingent the best for Tokyo Olympics. First of all, thank you AR Sports Ken to give me this wonderful opportunity. मैं बास्केटबॉल में चार बार और जूडो में एक बार नेशनल प्लेयर रह चुकी हूँ खेलों के प्रति मेरा जो रुझान है सिर्फ स्पोर्ट्स गेम की बदौलत है मैं ओलंपिक टीम के सारे एथलीट को पूरे भारत वासियों की तरफ से तहे दिल से शुभकामनाएं देती हूँ चीयर फॉर इंडिया गो फॉर गोल्ड To participate in the Olympic quiz, tune into our program Sports Scan at 7:20 p.m. every day. In the run-up to the Tokyo Olympics, the News Services Division of All India Radio, in its Sports Scan program, is broadcasting every day Olympic quiz with AIR News. Olympic quiz, Akashvani Samachar ke saath in Hindi. Every day a question related to Olympics will be asked at the beginning and closing of the program. To participate in this program, listeners can send their replies by email on airsportscan@gmail.com. The first correct answer received through email will be adjudged the winner of the quiz. The name of the winner will be announced in Sports Scan program the next day. It will also be flashed on AIR Twitter handle at AIR News Alerts. The Sports Authority of India will provide India team jersey to the winner. So tune in to the Sports Scan program every day at 7:20 p.m. on FM Gold and on our YouTube channel News on AIR Official. Now let us take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. Washington Post writes that growing number of Republican lawmakers urge vaccinations amid Delta variant surge. New York Times says Haiti arrests three police officers as part of investigation into president's killing. The Guardian says UK says it wants to substantially rewrite Northern Ireland Brexit protocol. Financial Times writes that Olympic quarantine orders rile Tokyo athletes and delegates. Globe and Mail writes that South African firm to make Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Himalayan Times says that massive wildfires in US West bring haze to East Coast. Gus Times writes that UNESCO removes Liverpool from World Heritage List. And now a quick look at the headlines once again. Over 41 crore 54 lakh doses of COVID vaccine administered in India so far. Indian recovery rate of COVID-19 reaches 96.36%. Defence Research and Development Organisation DRDO successfully flight test new generation Akash missile. Prime Minister Narendra Modi to share his thoughts with the people in Mann Ki Baat program on All India Radio on the 25th of this month. Ariel Henry sworn in as the new prime minister of Haiti and All India Radio Doordarshan and DD Sports to do a mega coverage of Olympics 2020. India is celebrating the 151st birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Before we end, let us listen to his favorite bhajan, Vaishnav Jan by artists from Maldives. वैष्णो वजन हो तेने कहिए जे बेल पर आए जाने रे वैष्णो वजन तो तेने कहिए जे बेल पर आए जाने रे पर दुखे उपकार करे तो ये मन अभिमान जन तो तेने कहिए जे बेल पर आए जाने रे
And with that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News. Thank you.